you take a full length practice test and realize half of the material on there is stuff you haven't even heard of before. You go and you check on Reddit and everybody's talking about low yield topics like it was half of their exam. But what is low yield? For me, it falls into two categories. Number one, topics that don't come up super often in the AMC practice materials. There's gonna be things like NMR. We only have one question on that compared to the 20 that we see on amino acids. And number two, the finer details within a higher yield topic. Take the action potential. The overall process is high yield, but the inactivation gate on the sodium channel, that's a low yield detail. And if you wanna do well in the MCAT, you need to make sure you've studied anything that's fair game on the test, rather than writing something off because it feels unlikely. Thankfully, the AMC, the makers of the MCAT, provide an outline. So double check it, make sure you haven't skipped over anything just because it wasn't emphasized in your prep book. So what about those overlooked details? Chances are using a prep book. And what they do is condense several thousand pages of textbook material into about 400. And that's a good thing. It allows you to rebuild your foundation quickly, but it comes at the expense of depth, which means we need a strategy. Our goal is to study in layers, planning out multiple passes to the same material using increasingly detailed resources. My general approach looks like this. Read my MCAT prep book, get some early practice problems, a little bit later, do some more, and then finally dive into a detailed resource. Ideally, all of this will be spaced out over time. And while I'm doing this, I'm taking notes and collecting different pieces of information all about the same topic in one place. Once I get to the second round of questions and detailed resources, I don't read every explanation or page in full. I skim until I hit something I haven't seen before. And since the MCAT mostly tests big picture understanding, I use those new details to reinforce the main idea rather than trying to memorize every fact in isolation. Take initiation and muscle contraction. Your prep book probably walked through the overall sequence and the key ions involved, but that's about it. Practice problems should now push your understanding further and teach you something new. All of this is a big abstract, so let's look at an actual question and see how this works. Go ahead and give this question a try. The correct answer is calcium. And it's okay if you don't know that. I'm gonna go through the explanation, and what I want you to do is think about how you can integrate the details into what you already know. Troponin is actually a three protein complex comprised of troponin C, I, and T. Each has a different role. Troponin I directly blocks the binding site on actin with tropomycin. Troponin T keeps troponin anchored to tropomycin, and finally, troponin C binds to calcium. With these details, it's really obvious to see why calcium is the answer. Now I'm gonna go through how I would integrate these details into what I already know. Go ahead and cross compare with what you did. So here's what I already know. In order for muscle contraction to occur, the cross bridge cycle needs to form. That means actin and myosin need to bind one another. In order for this to happen, the actin binding site needs to be available. And the only way that this can occur is if tropomyosin moves off of it. Now I know that this is going to be initiated by calcium. So calcium will come, it will bind to troponin, and that's what will move tropomyosin off, and then muscle contraction can occur. So if I think about it, these subunits make sense. Troponin I blocks the binding site on actin. Its role is to stop actin from interacting there with tropomyosin. Troponin T binds tropomyosin. Again, this makes sense. They're linked together in their function. And finally, troponin C binds calcium, which explains exactly how calcium can trigger muscle contraction. This also helps me remember what calcium binds to, troponin and not tropomyosin, since that's easy to get mixed up. We're not just memorizing the three subunits, we're using them to explain a process we already understood. And this approach does a few things. One, new details strengthen your big picture understanding instead of stealing time from the more tested material. Two, the details now stick because they're connected to what you already know. And three, you're practicing a core MCAT skill, using big picture knowledge to reason through unfamiliar details because what feels low yield often isn't. Just be careful not to fall into a time trap. If you got your foundation down, practice questions should still be your main focus. I like to set a timer, 20 to 30 minutes, and when time's up, I stop reading and go back to practice for the day. Preparing for low yield material doesn't have to take a ton of extra time and it can prevent you from being blindsided on test day. The key is studying strategically and having a plan from the start. 